we're, we're really glad you're here. Uh, this is program is sponsored by the Dumberston Conservation Commission and the Bonnie Vale Environmental Education Center. And uh, we are really making a real effort to educate uh, people in the, in the community and in the region about the natural resources of the region so that going into the future we can make some really good decisions about how we're going to go forward. Um, and one of the neat things is that not only will you see it, but it will be watched repeatedly on community television. Uh, we have it videotaped and, they, and people watch those lots and then it's on our website. And so people from all over the world can watch it forever. So <laughs> however long the internet goes on, <laughs> whichever goes first. So we're really glad you're here. We have a donation jar out here so that if you um, can leave a donation, we appreciate that. Um, there are some costs involved in doing all of this. And um, we have a, a, another good program coming up in December. We don't have, I think it's gonna be December 5th. It's been, uh, and it's gonna be about birds at your bird feeder. Uh, we really wanna keep you posted on what's happening at your bird feeders here in Dumberston. We've had a lot of trouble with bears at our bird feeders in the winter. And um, so, um, Ed Pocus is coming to talk with us and he's going to have, we used to have Chris Petrak came from time to time and had gorgeous pictures that he took. And so uh, Ned has those pictures, so they'll be Chris's pictures. So that's an incentive to get here. So beautiful bird pictures. So without further ado, I want to introduce Patty Smith from the Bonnie Vale Environmental Education Center and Skip Lyle, who's- Stand up, Skip. Pardon? Yes, stand up, Skip. <laughs> <laughs> and your business is called Beaver Deceivers International. Beaver Deceivers International. Mm -hmm. So, I'm so check on one more person who we're waiting for, and um, you go ahead. Well, those of you who know me at all know that <clears throat> beavers, well, yes, rodents <laughs> are my favorite creatures, and beavers are among my favorite rodents. And this evening, my intention is not only to share with you some of the great experiences I've had with beavers, but to persuade you that they are, in fact, the most important animals, bar none, in our region. And, of course, I know that many of you may have different opinions about beavers. And to help us make sure that there are no further problems with beavers, we have Skip, who will be speaking after I share my favorite beaver stories, and thank you for Skip. So, I always begin my presentations by saying that I grew up in the woods of Vermont and have always loved wildlife and nature, and so therefore always beavers, but there are a couple reasons that I love beavers, and one is that I spend a lot of time in the woods, and it can get a little monotonous just hiking in the woods, 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 until you come to these little openings, this is the woods in my backyard, woods, 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 but down in that stream valley, there's my house right there, you suddenly come into a very different world and it's all thanks to beavers. When I first moved into the house that I live in now, it was 10 years ago, and that first night I just headed out to where I knew the best place to sleep was going to be, and it was in a beaver meadow about a mile out that stream. And sure enough, the next morning I heard some tromping. It was pretty early in the morning. Tromp, tromp, tromp. I, said, I live near Marlboro College. I thought, college students up this early? I don't think so. And it's not a great moose picture, but I had my camera handy. You can see the moose in there. So <sighs> this is all brought to me by beavers. Just downstream from that beautiful meadow is this pond. I took a picture that morning, and this is Popple's Pond, <laughs> and um, I might have just, you know, remained an aloof admirer of beavers, except that I discovered this book called Beaver Sprite by Dorothy Richards, and she is one of these people who was fortunate enough to have beavers introduced into her backyard in the Adirondacks in the 1940s or 50s, I don't know, but she became a beaver freak. <laughs> and in reading her book, I learned that beavers are intelligent and curious and have a sense of 
humor and are companionable. She was such a kook about beavers that she also got a permit to keep pet beavers, and she had a pool built in her basement, and eventually a pool built that was connected to her house. It was called the Y. So the beavers just came and went from the house. And I don't know if you can read the caption, but it says, Hunk and I were equally pleased with our affection for one another. And she and this beaver had an amazing relationship. So while I like sitting on beaver at beaver ponds, now I had another goal. I wanted to really get to know the beavers there. And so I set out that next spring to that same pond that I had visited the fall before. And uh, I think it took nine visits to the pond before the beavers were coming up to visit. But, um, nine, hi Kathy, nine, nine visits, but I cheated by bringing them things they like to eat, poplar, for example, their favorite tree, and, um, I can't tell them apart in the water, I mostly tell them apart by behavior, but that's snowberry, and they became very accustomed to people. Um, Alan Dater and Lisa Merton, you know them, great filmmakers. They're my neighbors also. So they came out to take this little film. So the great thing about going to visit a beaver pond is you always know you're going to see wildlife. And you, if you're going to choose an animal to study, Beavers are the logical one because you always know exactly where to find them. And if they don't happen to be in their pond at a particular time, you can just go upstream or downstream. They're not going to become nuisance animals and go hang out in people's yards and beg for handouts. And um, by bringing them treats, I got them to take an interest in me, too. So I get to see a lot of behaviors that I might not be able to see if they're just off in the pond doing their own thing. So this is my little friend Dewberry having an apple. <coughs> Bunchberry just hanging out in the middle of the pond. They're just, this is evening, so they're very nocturnal, but um, you'll see them an hour before dark. And I don't see them in the early morning. They, they tend to go to bed before the sun comes up. So see how great they are at manipulating objects with those little front paws and those they're they're great diggers, so they have very strong digging claws and very muscular shoulders. So we're gonna so I'm going to take you now um, to my very favorite pond and um, just through the seasons of my favorite beaver watching site. And um, that is Lake Dismal. It's the spot I call Lake Dismal. It was a very ugly pond and I was disappointed when the beavers decided that that's where they wanted to be. Um, <laughs> It was, it was always dark and gloomy and narrow. But they decided to move from beautiful Surprise Pond just downstream, and I think it's partly because they found a dam beginning to form already across a narrow part of the stream. And very quickly they built up this dam. Uh, they used, they, so they already had a bit of an obstruction there, and they piled rocks and logs, and then started digging out the the pond bottom and spreading mud on it. And before you knew it, there was a pond there. Not a lake, but a pond. Um, they started chewing on this pretty good size yellow birch. And uh, you can see the pond is, or the brook is way down there at that point. They worked on this tree for a long time. Yellow birch is kind of a hardwood. But eventually they got it down, and by that time the pond is backed right up to the bottom of the tree. And the next spring, whoops, pushing the wrong button. 
There we go. The stump is now in the water. And you can see that Lake Dismal has formed. <laughs> the lodge building was so cool. So I was sitting underneath all the horrible little spruce and fir trees on the bank of the little brook. And uh, I noticed the beavers swimming in and out of the bank right next to where I was sitting. So they had a bank lodge there. That was their first home, starter home. And beavers often do that. They dig a burrow in the bank. In fact, beavers always have bank burrows. Even if they have a regular stick lodge, they'll have bank burrows up and down the edge of the pond and up and down streams. And then they started piling mud on top of their bank burrow and sticks on top of their bank burrow. And eventually I could hear them in there digging up through the top of the bank and into the pile of sticks. And then you could hear them gnawing away at the sticks. So they're creating a chamber inside here and I could peek in through there and see nice, fuzzy, dry little baby beavers in there, which was a treat, because one very seldom gets to see dry beavers. <laughs> and by fall, they had a giant mound piled up there with mud on top that freezes like concrete, and their food cache in front. See this giant pile of sticks out in front of the lodge? That's what they live on all winter. I forgot to mention that um, while they were doing this, I was spending nights sleeping out there next to the lodge, and you could hear their great pitter-patter of beaver feet as they, they grab up piles of mud and sticks to their chest with those little paws, and they hold it down with their chins, and they get up speed, and they get up on their hind feet and run up as far as they can, and then they flop over, <laughs> and then they pat it down and shove it down and push the sticks in as far as they can, and they go back for another load. So it didn't make for great sleeping, but it was very entertaining. And this was the result of all that hard work. And finally, winter comes and the pond freezes. And up where I am in Marlboro, it really freezes solid. And so the beavers essentially can't get out for weeks or even months at a time. So they really depend on that um, the food that they've laid up and the deep channels that they have excavated in the mud of the bottom so it doesn't freeze to the bottom. And this is the top of the food cache there. You can see what they eat. And the beavers do really try very hard not to uh, get frozen under. This is Willow the beaver trying to keep a hole open. Didn't last very long. <laughs> How many beavers were doing that work? Um, that year, there was Mama and Papa who were mostly trying to keep the ice open. There were five beavers at the, the height of this particular colony. And in winter, you can tell that beavers are in a lodge because their breath, uh, they don't cover the top with mud. So there's always a vent with warm air coming up that keeps a hole melted. And eventually, there's a, a March thaw, February thaw, January thaw. The beavers are out, and they can now climb up and get some of the branches they couldn't reach before. The snow is deep enough. Lucky beavers. Let's see. And finally, <coughs> some of these things are not going to work. Oh, well. Um, spring arrives, and now we're going to. I don't have the very cute picture of the baby beaver, so we may have to get back to that at the end. Um, that next spring, my very favorite baby beavers were born, the dewberries, and they were just very affectionate and personable. And uh, one of them, I think, is still around. Um, so now just a quick look at a few of the, the things that make beavers so good at what they do. And first is this beaver fur coat. You can see they've got this layer of, of long golden guard hairs that sort of shunt the water off. And underneath is this very dense, thick, woolly coat that really keeps water from penetrating to the skin so they're dry all the time in that amazing coat. And of course they must attend to their grooming so they get to watch a lot of beaver grooming. They've got one split claw on their hind foot that apparently they use as a comb to comb oils through their coat. Bunch berry. 
So um, they need to be aquatic. This aquatic environment makes them safe because they're large, ungainly rodents. But in the process of creating this environment that makes them safe, they're doing so much for the rest of the world. Well, the rest of the world that's occupied by beavers. Um, when snow melts in the spring, beaver ponds really help slow that runoff and hold water on the landscape. I discovered this great series of graphics that were part of someone's research on beavers. Um, they were looking in particular at incised stream beds where the, the stream is no longer connected in any way to its floodplain. And what happens when beavers finally arrive in a landscape like that? So we'll look at these closely. In the first case, you've got um, the deeply incised stream. And when beavers arrive in a situation like this, there's so much water flowing so rapidly through there that their dams often don't survive for very long. Also notice where the, the water table is here. So you get a blowout, the beavers put in their dams, you get a high flow. But at the same time, that helps to widen that incision trench. And it allows an inset floodplain to form. And then the stream has lower power because it spreads out. And this allows beavers to come back in and build more enduring dams. And uh, because streams that are in size like this often have a very high sediment load, they'll fill up with sediment, the beavers will move on, and now suddenly you've got an environment where all of these aquatic and, and water-loving plants can grow. Good riparian vegetation. Beavers come back and eventually they raise that water table right up so that it has access to the floodplain again and create this amazing network of streams, old dams, dead wood, and it really slows the flow of the water. And now I want you to imagine the power. OK, before we imagine the power. Um, some other things that happen when beavers create ponds, uh, you've got a lot of surface area, sunlight coming through, a lot more photosynthesis, a lot more phytoplankton that's feeding the zooplankton, that's feeding the multicellular organisms that are feeding the macroinvertebrates that are feeding the little fish. So it's a much richer, nutrient-rich um, aquatic environment. But the other thing that's amazing about beavers, ponds are great, all these things that happen in ponds are great, but then the beavers move. So this is the area behind my house, and all of these open meadows were created because beavers move. And in the case of my beavers, it's every year. Surprise pond, the beavers are gone, and pretty soon you've got meadow vegetation coming back in, dries up, wetland grasses, and wetland plants. And if beavers occupy the same place for long enough, you get sphagnum moss, deep sediments, really peaty organic soil developing, not the mineral soil that forests prefer. And pretty soon you've got these semi-permanent wetlands formed, where it would take a long, long time for a forest to grow back. One of my favorite local beaver meadows. And of course, um, thanks to the beavers and these ponds and all the other environments they're creating, you're creating habitat for all the ducks and geese and otters here, otter tracks and muskrat and mink and bears really depend on these wetlands in the spring when the first green sedges are coming up. Speed up to my backyard during tropical storm Irene. So I'm hiking out to the little bridge where I cross the stream, see water running down the wooded hillsides, 
over the bridge, out through the woods. why this show has been all messed up. I apologize. So here's a picture of uh, that same bridge the day after Irene. And you can see it's just a tiny little stream flowing under the bridge. But Irene has left behind this giant berm of, of stone excavated from the bottom. Now I want you to imagine the volume of water we had during Irene coming through something like that as opposed to coming through something like that. And it's just beaver-generated wetlands do a tremendous amount to remediate from the effects of, of extreme high water events. So floods, beavers help tremendously, especially, especially places where beavers have been there long enough to build up these great spongy wetlands and widen the floodplains really slow down the water, give fish a place to get off out of the, the main rocky torrent. Um, but they may have an even greater purpose, not purpose, but um, function in times of extreme drought. And Skip, you know Glennis Hood? I've met her. Yeah, well, I was watching a little uh, beaver talk she was giving today, talking about, she's, she's a biologist who researches beavers in Alberta, Canada, where it's much drier, flatter, and in times of drought, um, she found in her research that ponds that had beavers active in them, not just ponds that beavers used to live in, but ponds that had beavers active in them had far more water in them during times of drought than, than any other pond. And it's partly because beavers actively dig out the bottoms and make ponds deeper. They're just the best engineers for holding water on the landscape. And at, someone asked a question at the end because she then mentioned the importance of beaver deceivers, um, figuring out how people can live with beavers. And someone sent in, emailed in a question that said, she mentioned you, Skip. You personally and your company. And someone said, how do we invest in these beaver deceivers? So, so. Send a blank check. Send a blank check. All right, we're going to see if we can get this to open up and show some pictures. All right, maybe, why don't we have, why don't we just turn this over to Skip right now? I'm, going to, I'm just going to start by saying that um, Skip Lyle, Skip lives in Grafton, and um, he was, you want to tell the story about your parents' pond? Sure. Okay, tell the story about your parents' pond. That could be something to talk about. Okay. Well, you were. Okay. <laughs> but like Patty, I grew up in the woods of Vermont, too. Um, but I was really lucky because I grew up on a beaver pond. Um, and so from a, a very early age, I, I got a, a sense of, uh, of the value of it that this Patty has hit on just a little bit. <laughs> the incredible value for other wildlife. Um, because I was, I was observing it, with the wildlife coming and going, and uh, you know, it's a, everything's relative. So that was basically relative to the the density of life and wildlife activity in the surrounding uplands. And so I re I realized early that uh, it was really good to have the beavers around. I probably, uh, to be frank, um, thought that way because I was a hunter. I hunted a lot when I was young and. So I, I wanted I wanted a landscape that was healthy and productive because I thought I might benefit from it. But uh, over the years, I, I just um, have gained a tremendous appreciation, not only for its productivity, but it, all the flood-related um, values that Patty mentioned and the uh, amazing uh, beauty of it and the entertainment value of being able to watch wildlife. And uh, roadside flowages, that's a term I use for beaver-created beaver wetlands. I learned it when I was in Maine. Um, 
you know, when they're beside ro uh, roads, the roads are just wonderful viewing platforms. Uh, in, in some sense, that makes the wetlands even more valuable. But when my parents um, bought the land in, in uh, 1965, there were no beavers there because they hadn't yet returned from the fur trade. Um, but beavers were probably widespread and common throughout most of North America um, for roughly 10,000 years. I mean, even it could be two million, but, but from the glacier, retreat of the glaciers until the beginning of the fur trade, when Europeans arrived around 1600, when the beavers started to be eliminated. And so they, they were gone for hundreds of years from most of New England. And, uh, and they've only returned recently at our particular property uh, not until the early 1970s, the first beaver returned there. And, and I say return because beaver habitat or beaver damming habitat is very, very predictable. And it's completely um, dependent on physics or determined by physics. And it's essentially low energy sites on the landscape. Or in other words, uh, small streams in, in low gradient areas. Because beavers are economists and they also like to survive uh, predators and predation and so they don't like to occupy and try to dam sites where a, a large flood event will destroy their dam because then they're vulnerable to predators and they have to spend a lot of energy rebuilding the dam um, it, as well if it's if it's on more of a slope a steep slope then it, you have to build a huge dam for a very small wetland and so that's bad economics and so that, that that's uh, really uh, the good thing about that is it limited limits greatly the extent of the, the uh, beaver-human conflict. Um, beaver damming habitat in Vermont, which is even less in many places because it's so mountainous here, may only represent one or two percent of the landscape, and that's not going to that's not going to change. Um, and are, are you up, ready to go? Almost, but you keep going. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm not sure what I was getting at now, but, um, <laughs> but anyway, anyway, oh yeah, I, I know where I got off on that tangent was when I said they've returned, returned. And so that, that's really important to know because it's not an invasion of exotic uh, species taking over our property. They, they're, what is happening and what we've been witnessing <laughs> for the last 50 years roughly um, is the beavers trying to return this tiny percentage of the landscape the way it always <coughs> was, the way it always was, and, and, and making it much richer, by the way, for wildlife. So it's, a, it's, it's kind of a neat thing, although there's a lot of conflicts, we can deal with those, but it's awful neat to be living in a time where this uh, unparalleled keystone species has survived, barely, and made a tremendous recovery. And so now we have all these, only a little bit of the landscape, but lots of little wonderful, beautiful flowages that we can enjoy. My grandparents never saw a beaver flowage, you know? And so it's, a, it's an exciting time in that respect. And I will continue with that. Can I ask a question before? Yeah. Where did they go? I mean, you said, you said that they... Where did they go? Where did they go? They went to they adorn back. the hats of Europeans, yeah. okay. the heads they, of they, Europeans. They, yeah. They, yeah, how many, how many beavers? Who knows? 100 million, maybe? were turned into decorative hats for Europeans. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. <laughs> you guys have never had a, your beaver hat, but anyway. Where did the stock a, We are a vain up. species. What? Where did the surviving ones hide to be able to yeah, come back? Yeah, well, in, in remote places. Very, yeah, I guess a yeah. few, I mean, very remote parts of Canada, mainly. Yeah, yeah not so many. So they've come all the way. Well, uh, there were, they were actively reintroduced in many cases. In yeah. Vermont, they were actively reintroduced. I think six were released yeah. in the Bennington area and the... From yeah. Canada? Yeah. Canadian? Uh, there were, maybe elsewhere there by were then. There a few in northern Maine that survived. Maybe a few in Adirondacks. Yeah. 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 But they would have done it on their own. And they've done 99.9% .9 of that recovery all on their own. But right. the, state, the states did give them a little boost mm -hmm. initially. Yeah. <laughs> Were any here? I think some of the first beavers were introduced in Bennington and probably made their way up from there. 
Yes. Yeah. It, well, yeah. From a, it's been a remarkable recovery for a slow yeah. moving, really fairly slow reproducing animal yeah. that's that, you know, been under a lot of predatory pressure. So we can count ourselves very lucky. Very. Fortunately, we can we can we can also eliminate the conflicts if we go about it correctly. <laughs> so, Patty, tell any, any interrupt any time you want to get back to your thing. I was actually pretty much okay. done. I wanted to show folks this slide um, from the Western U.S., where beavers have become much more highly valued, at least by people who are, who are ranchers or have real concerns about water issues. So this shows snowpack change out west from 1955 to 2014, 100% decrease by the darkest orange and uh, up to 10% decrease light orange. You can just see that they've really lost snow and some of the technological solutions, of course, are build giant dams to impound water, but people are coming up with a much more sensible solution. And uh, California and this Grand Canyon Trust, Oregon are all, folks there are really interested in reintroducing beavers into these arid environments in particular where they can create lots of miniature impoundments and really hold the water on the land, raise water tables, um, cool the water at the same time. And uh, I think it's very exciting when we, we look at pictures like this and imagine how much heat is being generated by an environment like this. and. Uh, how little water soaks into the soil in so much of places like California and, and these human constructed environments. And that a great solution to cooling the climate might be right here. <laughs> right here, yes. Beavers are part of this cycle with the, with the wolves, the elk. What have you, yeah, exactly. You know, you know, the wolves are back, moving the, the elk. The, the, the trees are growing back because the elk are no longer grazing it down to grass. And the beavers are, are moving in and slowing the water down. Yeah, so uh, Glynis Hood, her study, I've got a few numbers here. Um, the number of active beaver lodges explained over 80% of the variability in the area of open water during droughts. Temperature, precipitation, climatic variables were much less important than beaver in maintaining open water areas. Um, so during some of those droughts, she was saying that the, the ranchers would go to their neighbors that had beavers on their land to find places where the cattle could graze. Those were the only places where they had water. Um, Is this in Alberta? That picture? No. no I mean, oh, yes, in Alberta. Yeah, yeah. And here we are, Sackett's Brook in Putney, and there's our Sand Hill Road <laughs> situation. And you can see that um, this is all fabulous wetland that's just full of great wildlife, wildlife, you've all seen wildlife there, um, and cleans the water. And because there's this road running right through the middle, the beavers are always ending up in trouble with the, the road crew. And I think this is Skip's house. He has created the most amazing wetland habitat there by making it all a, a beaver-friendly environment. Yeah, that's all it costs. That's all it costs. It's all it costs. Yeah, and, so... And combined with the self-discipline not to kill them. And that's so, all you have to do. Yeah, it's... it's <laughs> they do all the work. It's not free, but it, and it takes a little effort, but with a little effort and a little commitment by all of us, we can create a landscape that is much more friendly to beavers and therefore friendly to wildlife, wildlife habitat. Your house again. Yeah, it's that's very, the original beaver to see. That's the site, original beaver to see. The site of the original beaver to see. <laughs> so I think I will turn it over to you now because. 
okay. with a fish ladder. And I just have one question. Um, so during Irene, you can really have serious damage from that rollage? Not up there. I, a few beaver dams went out, but not places, you know. One of them was a place where the beavers were living, but it makes a big difference, the, the water quality downstream. It wasn't full of sand and rocks and clay. Um, the fish were able to swim out to the edges. The beavers were all fine because they could get out of the fastest flow. So it was really like a flooded forest. And I've heard other people say that water quality just downstream from rivers that had been colonized by beavers was um, much less damage to erosion and uh, higher wa water quality. I have to give this to you. Seems like the, it's dramatic <coughs> uh, neg negative news that we often focus on. And one thing that does happen occasionally, especially during big floods, is a beaver dam will break and you'll get a big, a big flow that can, on occasion, cause big damage, big damage. But you have to balance that against all the other, the vast majority of beaver dams that don't break and actually hold water on the landscape and reduce those peak flows that, are, that cause all of the damage. But you don't hear about that because it's hard to measure, hard to visualize, whereas something dramatic and negative gets attention. I, another, another story about uh, flood water retention that I witnessed at my property, which has about maybe eight, eight beaver dams. And the thing about a lot of floods is, is they come in the fall when, when they're related to hurricanes, and a lot of droughts happen in the late summer, say August. And as I was saying earlier, the beaver damming habitat is on, are on small streams. And there's, a, you know, there's quite a range there in that, in that category. But a lot of the ones that are up towards the smallest watershed uh, end of the spectrum um, will we'll lose water during those droughts and, and sometimes they dry out completely but that the water will just drop down and so you have and then and so this one time I had a tremendous rainstorm on the on the heels of a drought like that where all the beaver ponds the water was really low so that so it had the, the amount of water that was that the, these ponds could retain was just at its maximum it, and it was a tremendous rainstorm and I went around at the end of it, and, I, and all the beaver ponds were full of water. And I went down to the, the beaver dam on the far downstream end, and it was very, very full, and there wasn't any water coming out of the stream. Those, it had captured all, all of a great deal of rain. So that's, that's another, another thing that can happen. Uh, we're ready for your... Oh, yeah. Can, can you... You want to go into slideshow? Yeah, you? please. Uh, because that, that allowed me to keep talking. I, I just want to mention, Patty Rob reminded me of this when she was talking about the West and, and how dry it is there, but, but wet, wetlands are incredibly important because they're so important to thousands of life forms in different, thousands of different species. Um, but they're, they're really rare too, I mean even in the best of times they were rare. And, and then we developed the continent and, and we've destroyed maybe 70% of our wetlands are gone, <laughs> are gone. And, and it didn't just, thanks Patty, mm -hmm. it didn't just happen out west, it, it didn't just happen in Hoboken, New Jersey, or you know, the, the suburbs of Boston where they drained all the salt marshes. And if you, sometimes you fly into Logan, you look down, there's these lines everywhere, everywhere through the salt marsh. But I find those dredge lines everywhere here in rural Vermont, in the most, most uh, uh, out of the way places. Um, the Pleasant, Pleasant Valley Road in Saxons River comes to mind where the, the, there's a wreck area there and it's a great long straight valley and there's this dredge, dredge line right down the, through the whole thing because we're agriculturalists, uh, at least we were for a long time, but we don't farm rice, right? <laughs> you know any rice farmers? Yeah. Yeah. Farm, farm yeah. most other things in Vermont On the West-West West Road there is one. Is there really? <laughs> Figures. <laughs> but, uh, anyway. <laughs> so given the fact that we're not rice farmers for the most part, the wetlands are our enemies. You know? So we want to we have every, 
every quarter acre that we can to be dry so the sheep can go out there or maybe you can plant crops or whatever. And so the, the, the nice thing about the recovery of beavers is this is chance to recover some of that. There's a lot of ecological and bio, biological losses we're, we're enduring around the world, you know, and there's not much most of us can do about it. But with this particular issue, there's a great deal we can do about it right in our own backyards. A great deal to, to uh, build, build our biological capital. One of the things I wanted to say, because I'm an old, old Vermonter, was when I was a kid, and this is part of the, the whole thing with beavers, people were dynamiting their dams and they were getting rid of those yeah. darn beavers. Well, they, that, that mindset is still there. That hasn't and it, gone and away. And it's the agricultural yeah. thing yeah. because that wetland, you can't plant yeah. corn. The, the only thing that's changed is that it's not legal to do use of dynamite anymore. Well, but they, people will be doing it, right? They still trap them, yeah. but they, they trap them and remove them more now. <laughs> well, at least they say they do. They say they it's do. Very, yeah, they're killing them everywhere. The beavers are being treated and managed as a pest species, Still. not a keystone species, which is what they are, you know, without dispute. And that's how they should be managed. They're being managed as a pest to be eradicated. But, but are we so still we got, doing that? So we got some work to do. We're not no dynamite now. But how much are we still doing that? A lot. It, and is your talk and your presentation going to educate people to make them stop? <laughs> I, I've been trying to get people to change the way they think for decades. For not I much want to lot. know about the beaver deceiver. I hope, I hope so. But <laughs> what? The beaver deceiver. Oh, really? I got to talk about that? <laughs> you talk lot, about that. How much time do we have? We got a lot of things to grapple with Seven here. Seven minutes. Huh? Seven minutes. Well, this ends at eight. <laughs> no, we all stay. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna stay. Okay. Okay. No, those those are great points. Great points. And that, that's a problem. We have to we have to become better stewards and we should all we should all be stewards we should all feel that sense of responsibility we dominate the earth and and and, and we every species their, their fate is in our hands every one of them and we should we should be, uh, be humbled by that and and uh, take that take that uh, responsibility seriously but that kind of goes against perhaps human nature and certainly our history um, you know we're, we're conditioned to just dominate and kill, you know. There's a reason why we don't have any mountain lions and wolves in Vermont, you know. I mean, and, and why we wiped out the beavers. And so we ha we have this uh, real um, uh, antagonistic relationship that we've had for a long time with nature, and uh, it's still going on. It's a little more subtle now, but it's, it, it still goes on in a, in a big way with beavers, which is one reason I've tried tried so hard to uh, to come up with. Uh, um, effective and economical and, and uh, uh, non-lethal remedies for the conflicts. Um, and, and just to tie into what I said a little while ago, it's uh, so, so, so much is about context and understanding the, the extent of the threat and uh, how serious it is and that sort of thing. And so the, the, the mere fact that beavers only, only can occupy a very tiny percentage of the landscape in any given town means that there's only a, a finite, a small, finite and manageable number of conflict points that we can eliminate. You just check them off very quickly. You can beaver-proof your town. But if you don't, if you do it lethally, I, I mean, killing beavers is to, is to, as, a, as a remedy to this problem is one of the most expensive assumptions in society now. But uh, so many people embrace it, and, and so all it means is that you're guaranteeing that that conflict will just keep cycling in, in perpetuity um, as new beavers arrive. And when I talk about these conflicts, I'm mostly talking about culvert sites. Remember I said beavers are economists, and they seek out good habitats. In, in, uh, one of the most important features of a good habitat, maybe the most important, is a damming site. You know, sometimes it's a, they have to build a great long dam across the flat valley. That does not, you know, a lot of energy they have to put into that. But the ideal damming site is a very, very, very short, very, very <laughs> short dam. Ideally, if a great massive man-made dam is already in place. So that, that describes every road. 
<laughs> Every road culvert. It's just a giant dam with a little tiny hole in it. <laughs> Another way to, d to describe that is it's a beaver magnet. It's a beaver magnet. They're, these animals, maybe all species, are, are just so good at, at, at uh, determining what's a good habitat and where they can survive and where they can save energy. It's amazing. Um, beavers are also territorial animals. So you, you know, you never, you, it's impossible. You can't ever get a population explosion. They don't tolerate the presence of other beavers. And so, and, and beavers are great explorers of the landscape. We've seen that in the last 50 years as they've, they've sort of taken back much of North America. They're, uh, you know, chunky little things and they're slow moving, but they're persistent. There's a good lesson there too. Being persistent, let's do keep, keep working. You know, and so they've, they've, uh, they cover a lot of ground slowly. And so what are they looking when, when they're dispersing and, and out there exploring the landscape? What are they looking for? They're looking for a high quality habitat, good damming site, and a vacant habitat, right? And so what, what happens when we protect a culvert lethally? We're creating a vacant habitat, and, and by not protecting the culvert, we're just you know, leaving it as a high quality, attractive damming site. So it's a beaver magnet. <laughs> as long as you're killing beavers as your remedy, you'll, it'll never end unless you can, you can get the overall population very low. And there's a big effort going on, I think, to do that. Is that what, is that what you want, your keystone species? That's, can, has the potential of creating tremendous wildlife habitats for you all over the place and a lot of beauty. I think improving your property value, I think it's the most attractive part of my property. Um, so that's not, I, I always assume that that, you know, it's just our, our agencies would never, it would never get to that point. You know, beavers are just too, it was too widely acknowledged that they were really valuable. It would never get to the point where they were, the, the populations got really low. low but, the potential exists because they're very, very long seasons with unlimited harvest. And then in addition to that, sort of regulated killing is, is a, as I've said, a huge amount of um, unregulated killing of nuisance, quote unquote nuisance animals. Ah, whew, I'm tired. <laughs> I was in Mississippi two days ago. You have more than one slide? <laughs> what? You have more than one slide. That's it. That's oh. it. No, no, no. Wait, no. I, I, if, I, if I lose this thought, I'll never come back. Go for it. Oh, yeah, I know what it was. Yep. Hold, it, hold your thought, too, Bob. Oh, yeah. um, so a beaver dam is made out of sticks and mud, right? So th th that, there's a lot of decay processes going on in it all the time, as you might imagine. It's nice and moist, too. And so that does not persist in the absence of beavers. You know, I talk about, you know, you kill beavers and you lose wetlands. And during the fur trade, they all, they all drained. Millions, maybe, of these wetlands, flow, flow just drained out because there was no beavers to maintain those decaying dams. And, they, and, they, and in, in the forested parts of the continent, they all became forested. They disappeared. That's the, in, in a, the natural condition of a flowage is an open marsh um, because beavers will either permanently or intermittently dam that site and we don't have trees that can grow in the water. So they don't, they don't get forested in the presence of beavers. But during the fur trade, they all became forested. And that's why you see standing dead timber in these modern flowages all over the place. It's a, another fascinating thing. You look at a dead tree and a, a beaver flowage, and that's a sign of the arrival of Europeans 400 years ago. It's pretty neat, but it's fleeting. It's fleeting because they're, they're not going to, that forest isn't going to grow back up. I don't think we're going to have another fur trade. And those forests aren't going to return to those habitats. So we, again, we live in an age where there's all these big, beautiful dead trees and with bird nests in them and stuff and these flowages. And, and our grandchildren may not be able to see that. So we're, we just timed it just right. So get out there and enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, Bob? Let me ask one question. Yeah. You seem to kind of walk away from it, but. Uh, she asked, hide. what is a beaver deceiver? Yeah. The way I look at yeah. what you do is you find, you assess the situation, yeah. and you find a way to keep the water going through the town culvert to avoid damming problems and erosion of the road, and yet you still maintain water levels in the marsh or the wetland. Yep. And you, you through piping and yeah, yeah. flow methods and yep. so forth, 
he's, he's found a way to make that work. He's obviously very good at it because, <laughs> as I understand, he's actually done work in Europe. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I know there's one in New Hampshire. Oh, he's been all over the state. to keep the beavers? He's never in Vermont anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he just got back There's seven brand new ones right now in Tennessee and Alabama yeah. and yeah. Mississippi. But anyway, yeah, I'll get, I'll get, I'll show you some pictures okay, and get into the details. But I just think, I try to frame this thing, you know, the context of it. I think it's so important to understand that. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's everybody pray. So this is this is kind of my uh, idea of what what you know ancient wetlands or, or what beaver floaters should look like. They're based open, rich, open marshes, basically. And uh, this is one without without any water in it, but you, you see no dead trees. This is in Maine, but open, open. And, you know, beavers would come and go, the water would go out, you know, who knows what, what the cycle is. It varies for, for a lot of different reasons, uh, but not long enough for a whole forest to grow up before, the, you know, new, new beavers would arrive, reflood it, and kill the little saplings, and it would stay open. This is uh, from above. Well, where is this? Anyway, oh, that's the same spot. It's the same spot. It's in Maine, yeah. It's an open wetland and a couple, these are active, see the lodges and the dams? Those are active um, places, but open, not forested. And uh, Is the water flowing towards the road? Or? Yes, it is. And I have a beaver deceiver right there. And uh, the, the awesome thing about the beaver deceivers is it allows you to keep live beavers in the vicinity. Because sometimes beavers will travel a long ways just to clog a culvert. And so to really effectively, effectively protect a culvert, you have to kill all the beavers, not just some of them, you have to extirpate them in a broad area forever, okay? So you wanna have any wetlands here if, if, if you were to effectively uh, do that without a flow device or, or beaver deceiver. It's usually not done effectively. It could be, it could be. It's usually not, and that's why we have a lot of clogged culverts, but. And so, yeah, this is a, the way what early maps from the 1600s look like. Beavers were the coin of the realm, and, and everybody was seeking them out. And they're very easy to find, and they're very easy to catch. And that's what, what happened to them. It's a, as Patty was mentioning that sort of uh, under, under fur, which is barbed, and it locks together to keep the water out, and it makes great felt as, for those reasons. And this is just a breach, that's uh, Cali. This is just a breach, a common breach in a beaver dam where the beavers have been um, killed and then the, the dam starts to decay and it'll get uneven. And when you get a flood, particularly during a flood, it, it'll, it'll wear down that low spot. The, the, the energy will be concentrated and then you lose your wetland just that quickly. Whereas if a beaver dam is recently maintained because beavers work at the water level, and this is an important, point in respect to building flow devices at work. Um, they work at the water line. They don't build a dam like humans do and then wait for the pool to, or the reservoir to fill up. And so as a result, beaver dams are perfectly level when they're, when they're recently maintained. And so then you get a big flood then and the water will sheet over that thing evenly over the whole thing. So it's less likely to blow out than an uneven dam mm -hmm. that's decayed for a while. So this is a, this is, it goes way back to some graduate work I did studying the return of beavers to a, a watershed in south central Maine. And this is a, a photograph from 1957. And this is from 1939. And again, to repeat myself, these are the same places that would have been dammed for 10,000 years prior to the fur trade. All, all the same places based on physics on physics, and they were, this is what it looked like. The beavers hadn't returned by 1939. It was just completely gone, um, big time forested. How did they manage to find um, the forest there? Like, how did they manage to let it work? Yeah. With the big trees? It's, it's pretty easy, Rachel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't get in their way, you know. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. It doesn't get in their way, you know. 
I guess I guess too. In addition to that, it's probably a lot more woody woody debris to make that dam out of in that in those circumstances. Yeah, this is. A, I worked. I, I sort of cut my teeth as a uh, flow device person at the Penobscot Indian Nation in Maine, and they had a. I started work there in 1995, and they have like 150,000 acres of tremendous, beautiful land and and beaver habitat, and they had a lot of problems, a lot of problems. So this is from there. This is from a piece of land right, right north of Bangor, but it's just cool. You see those those beaver lodges are so hot. This is an infrared film, and so they, they just stand out. They're so warm, and they're really valuable to a lot of wildlife, like turtles, for example, because of that. And the dams, the dams too, just very rich. And see all the, all that decay that's going on is creating heat too. And then this is so this would have been an early like you know maybe 1940 the beavers dam there, and you don't see any much standing dead timber, but this is just a recent recent dams down here, and you see it's all flooded timber. But it's, you know, a lot of people uh, get mad at beavers for a whole variety of things. But their, their return following the fur trade uh, does not represent any net loss of timber um, because these areas were never forested. It's only because of this anomaly of the fur trade that they became forested and, and look like that. And the, the great blue herons uh, love it <laughs> and a lot, of other, a lot of other wildlife. What? What did you mean by there were a lot of problems? Oh yeah, yeah, clogged culverts. Oh, culverts. Yeah, okay. yeah. Their culverts were clogged solid, and the roads were washed out everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's they told me to go out and try to do something, and that was in twenty over twenty years ago. And I thought, yeah, I could I could master this little challenge like in a year, you know, no no biggie. <laughs> and I'm still I'm still struggling. <laughs> and I haven't thought about much else since then. Uh, so it, it, I guess it, there's a point that goes along with that. Everybody seems to think that this is easy and that anybody can do it, and it's just not that way. And so I, and I've gotten to the point where I, I discourage people from trying it themselves or, or, or road crews or whatever. And I say, if you can scrape up the money, just have somebody who's really, really specialized uh, do this, because there's a lot more to it than you realize. There's some great blue herons. I bet a lot of you know this. Know this site over on Route 7, um, south of Manchester. If you're driving south, it, it, it's the Heron Rookery is over on the left there. I mean, think about those places like that. I mean, that's like the most beautiful place on Route 7 to me. Driving through that wetland with those beaver fl flowages on either side. I was just working on the Notches Trace Parkway, 444 miles long. To me, the most beautiful place on it was this roadside beaver flowages. The rest of it's kind of boring. And, uh, and then another site, uh, think of 80, Interstate 89 as you're heading uh, towards Concord from West Lab, and you're up in those hills up in there, and just, you drive right through the middle of some flowages up there. Really beautiful, beautiful country. Yeah, it's fun to see those nests. A lot of different uh, bird species taking advantage of these dead trees. <laughs> That's a hawk. I, I, I forgot what kind of hawk, but it's a hawk. And then, of course, they're not just beautiful and interesting and useful for wildlife when they're vertical. They're also pretty neat when they're horizontal. We have a, this is a, chi a chipmunk run right there. It's constantly being used by a chipmunk. And, and so you, think, you don't think of like a chipmunk as a wetland species, but they, there's all these species that are using the wetlands. And so it's a long, long list of animals that benefit. And then, of course, the water freezes in the winter, right up here, anyway. And then you have turkeys out there picking it, you know, wetland vegetation, and all these other species that wouldn't normally be considered wetland species using it. Ah, oh, that's cool, Bob. That's in Wyndham. That's up there, that high, high one up, uh, you know, to the to the east of town. And you can sort of read the history here, right? Because if, if these, all these dead trees are still standing, then you'd say, well, this was this flooded fairly recently. But they've all fallen over. All you have is the stumps. And so that was an earlier, the beavers arrived there earlier, maybe in 1960. Mm -hmm. 
and there's a lot of these root balls are turned up. Yeah, that's this is a this is a site that could potentially be a little dangerous, um, just because it's it's fairly big uh, wetland. And it's it's high up in a mountain, and it has a very short dam, so it's kind of a good damming site. Not as good as a culvert, but still good. And so a short dam can get taller, uh, and and taller faster than a great long dam. See those dams on the there, but yeah, you told me about. It. I want to go up there. there yeah. Dam up there. Here's yeah, I want to check that out. Yeah, yeah, they're all different. They're all different. Ah, oh, God, you got to get out there in the winter. It's a lot easier to walk across those wetlands then too, <laughs> or to ski, ideally. They're kind of miserable in the summer, I tell you, <laughs> especially in the. Uh, Mississippi, where every step you're you're like glued, you're glued to the substrate. Every step, it's like this. Oh. Okay, this is a, this is some of that Penobscot land too, and this this is exceptional. You know, I said one, one two percent of the landscape in Vermont. This is flat as a pancake there, and uh, so you have m many a much higher percentage of wetlands there. Uh, thanks to the it's all all beavers. All beavers, but this is these are every single one of these sites where you see beaver habitat. There's a culvert, and every single one of those was clogged and washing out. And so I have beaver to see at every one of those now. This may be the biggest beaver flowage in the world. It's I, I measured it once. It's like 80 acres. The di the dam here is a third of a mile long. So that's beavers are territorial. So that's that's one family of beavers that have built and maintained that whole dam. That's totally dependent on, uh, you know, the, the wetland is totally dependent on those those few animals. And so, what's that worth versus the, the value of you know, which is almost non-existent of their pelts. And they were traveling too from up here all the way down there to clog that culvert. <laughs> What is the value of their posts? Uh, most people just do it for the entertainment, for the trapping. They don't do it to make a living, I don't think. Yeah. It's, 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 oh, it's, it's, it's pretty low. It is pretty low. But I mean, that could change. I mean, if who knows? If China, you know, yeah. China uh, developed a fetish for yeah. beaver fur. <laughs> so here's, here's another uh, culvert site and, and see the dams. I was just at this. This is a different wetland, but again, huge, maybe 50 acres, and uh, you know, so you'd have to kill these beavers and drain that wetland to protect that culvert without a flow device. Um, that I think is the same one I was just talking about. Yeah, just a little bit better picture. I was working there actually this summer. Beautiful, just amazing. Ah. We don't have many many wetlands that big in Vermont. There are very few beaver flowages. What? So that's also one family maintained. Uh, absolutely. They're not going to share the damming duties with an, with another family. Even though it's so yeah, dams. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, they've been killed. They've been trapped there. So, so the water's all. I, and again, it's just there. The water's all the way down. There was absolutely no need to need to trap them. And I'm thinking, what? Why? Why risk the losses of this ecological wealth? It's it's insanity. Oh, that's a that's a different. Oh, that's I think that's the big one. Anyway, really cool places. So this is that really big one, and every time I go there, I see a moose and a bald eagle. It's, it's pretty amazing, and it's, it's always full of ducks. And that's a huge. So great, great value, you know, for the for people that love to enjoy wildlife non-lethally, and also a tremendous value for for hunters because. Um, some of these animals live in the wetlands exclusively, but other ones are going there to get fat and to get healthy and to, and to escape predators too. The, the wetlands are a good way for, for deer to run away from predators sometimes. I think it might make them a little vulnerable when the wetlands are frozen. Is that a beaver? But not lodge when, in the front? Moves, what? In the front though, is that a beaver lodge? Yeah, a beaver lodge? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great big double lodge there. What determines the size of the family? Are they, are they amount of acreage they're maintaining? Yeah, or, or more importantly, the the wealth of the wetland, of the, the food availability, predation rates, 
you know, that'll, that'll have a big effect on determining that number, especially if there's human predators involved. Mm -hmm. But coyotes will take a lot of beavers too, and, and a lot of other smaller predators will take beavers. Keep in mind that beavers come in all sizes, so little small beavers are vulnerable to a lot of different ones. Mm -hmm. See, when you go into an area and, um, and the people already there have killed a bunch of beavers and, you know, to get the culverts going, do they hear what you're saying, that beavers are good, or are they going to continue to kill them? Yeah. They are? Really? <laughs> Nobody's listening except for you guys. I swear to God, <laughs> not many people are listening. And, and, and uh, yeah, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. I, 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 I shake my head a lot as I don't think people are being taught about habitats and, and these types of issues and relationships in our in, our, in our, all of our years of school that we, we all go through. So if it so starts I don't know with, say, young, uh, with young kids, I mean, young kids often tell their parents, you know, and they, they get very um, protective of animals. Can education be implemented? The more the better. I should, but I, I'm not seeing big shifts in society. And, and, uh, and, and that's just, you know, just the ecological values, not, not to mention the hydrological values. Just, just focus on the ecological values alone. That makes it, you know, worthwhile to have a slightly different approach to this animal, that alone. But then if you stop killing them at your culverts and start pr really protecting them, we can save millions, millions of dollars of just being wasted with, with endless you know, returns of a backhoe to a culvert to clean it, endless cycles of that sort of thing. I'll show you some pictures of that activity. Am, am, are you guys sure you can stay here for a couple, three more hours? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's get to the culvert. Huh? Yes. Get to the culvert part. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. This this may turn into a, a non beaver deceiver talk. But <laughs> anyway, just for more context, right? Because we got it. That's so important, and I, we most of us just don't have that or sense of responsibility, right? Okay. We dominate the landscape. We humans. We're very successful species, you know. So that just gives you some idea, right? We, uh, we're the ones who have put the roads everywhere, right through the beaver habitats, so just not thinking about anything. And then we get mad as hell when the beavers dam a culvert. And getting mad, it, not, not only does it not solve the problem, but it doesn't, it doesn't acknowledge the fact that we set this, we set this thing up, this conflict up. Uh, it's like we don't have to take responsibility for anything. I, I don't know. It's not, it's not helpful to, to have that type of relationship with the natural world. And there's you know more people activity and a couple little flowages, but that, that's in Maine. Uh, this is rural Maine, you know, <laughs> really rural Maine, and that, that's that's what it looks like. So we are out there, as you all know, in, in a big way. Is that truck with 800,000 miles on it? Yeah, <laughs> that's got 300,000 on it, but that's <laughs> still going strong. Anyway, that's what it looks like when they clog culverts, and you see that all over the place. That's in Massachusetts. Another thing in Massachusetts, and they still haven't got that culvert protected. I've been driving by there for 20 years, and they've abandoned the road, and it's, oh, it's just, just not necessary. It's, it's so unnecessary. This is one of the first sites uh, on the Penobscot land. That's my buddy Jason Mitchell is a tribal member. And that's what it all looked like, all looked like. So it's, it's not, it's no different if this is in the suburbs of Boston or in the far north of Maine. It's the same issue. Um, and you see these scenes a lot. Don't start doing the multiplication okay. in respect to the hours involved in this type of thing. You, you, you won't. You'll refuse to pay your next tax bill. <laughs> <laughs> but it is primarily a, a, a male issue. I have to admit. <laughs> you women aren't don't have much responsibility for the roads. It's mostly men. Anyway, yeah, you see this a lot. This is a, on the Mohawk Nation land, and you know, ramrodding. You see all sorts of different things because those dams can be right inside the culvert, or they're usually at the mouth of the culvert. This is in Andover, New Hampshire, and they were ramrodding this culvert all summer long to the tune of thousands of dollars, and that didn't work, of course. And then they they had to rebuild the road, and they had to put new culverts in, and 
after about after about um, five years of that and fifty thousand dollars, five years of vetting me, you know, just nervously, nervously saying, "Oh, I don't know if we can do a beaver deceiver." I'm saying, "Well, what you are doing is not working, and it's costing you a lot of money. That you know, the the clock is running." <laughs> I don't know why that I have to be vetted so heavily. You, you know, if it doesn't work, you haven't spent a whole lot of money. You just rip it out again. You know, but God, this this is not a good model. This is in Virginia. It's the same issue in every every state. You know, all throughout Europe and Eurasia and and uh, every state except for Hawaii. Now, I like football a lot, but you don't. The nose look like the the stit, the seams or the what are they called the, the laces? The laces on a football. The beaver dam looks like the laces. So you don't want your culvert to look like a football. And this is a, a, an interstate. You think there's any value in that interstate in, in New York? I mean, it's delivering coke, so we definitely want to keep it open. <laughs> that would be a tragedy, right? But, I mean, we, I mean, every foot of that interstate might be worth a million dollars or something, and yet we don't do anything to protect the culverts except for beavers. This is in Wind I think that's Wyndham. Yeah. 121, Bob. I, I did a flow device there. Wyndham's been great to me. Done a couple flow devices. And uh, that's up in Maine. They're all the same. <laughs> They're all the same. <laughs> this old guy took a ride down to a culvert once. He was taking it apart with a data book. From the yeah. upstream side, yeah, that yeah. thing let loose. It can <laughs> get exciting. I, <laughs> I kind of like it. You're prettier now. <laughs> I like it too. Living on the edge, Bob. Oh yeah, he was right out there. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you see things like that. Like great. Oh, I think that's that's on the Notches Trace Parkway in Mississippi, and that's just uh, you know you see a lot of improvised things like that that don't do anything other than keep the dam out of the inside of the culvert, but it's just a good thing to dam against for the beavers. <laughs> they, you know, it's stuff like that everywhere. The trouble with stuff like this is that it, it requires that you kill all the beavers. It doesn't change anything. All it does is, is, uh, is hold them off long enough to get a trapper there, to get a shooter there. And then, and then not only that, but then society looks at all these failed so-called flow devices and say, oh, they, they can never work. Beavers are really smart. Patty and I have a debate about that. <laughs> so, uh, so then they, you know, they double down on killing and, and don't even, won't even, are afraid of flow devices. I've seen a lot of mattress springs over the years. <laughs> those, those mainers are, are pretty uh, economical <laughs> the way they do things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, that's that's you know, trespassing sign real effective. Yeah, that's that's gonna no I mean it's yeah. It's just a sterile pond. It's they'll never have a beaver that lives there very long before they have to kill it. So a lot of this awful, awful junk. Which Thousands, wow. thousands of these really have been put out there, and they've all failed. And uh, I don't know how to get people to recognize it. They have to, <laughs> they have to ramp up the quality a little bit. This is on Sand Hill Road. Yeah. So. Wow. Yep. Culvert number one. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Somebody stole the sign and put it in front of the. Yep. And I, one of my inventions was a, a trapezoid years ago, back in 1995. I don't use it anymore, but somebody, you know, I have these people out there copying it, but I never built anything of that, of that quality in my life. Oh, here's Patty's beaver. Oh. Yeah, you recognize it, Patty? Um, no. They all look, they all look the same. Yep. Yeah. Which makes, yeah, no. makes no. observing and, and Learning about beaver is really challenging, which is why it's so great that Patty puts in this effort. Because I, I don't do it. I don't have the patience. And you know, they're 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 in lodges and they're in the weeds and they're in the dark almost all the time. So it's really <laughs> really hard to to get to know your beavers and to recognize them. But anyway, the the, the question I always 
I always raise with this is, you know, what's going on, what I have to <laughs> deal with, what's going on inside the brain of a beaver, right? That's, that's the, the, the challenge I, I'm faced with. I don't know, there's a little light there. <laughs> there might be hope, there's a little light. But I love to say, not much. <laughs> it makes Patty mad. <laughs> okay, class. Human brain, beaver brain, okay? Okay, we ought to be able to do this thing. <laughs> but people, people like to think that they are really smart. And they, they, are, they have amazing amazing form of intelligence, which is beyond my understanding completely. But I know they don't, they're mostly prisoners of instincts, of their instincts, and they don't do a lot of our type of thinking, which is deductive reason, stepping back, looking at the big picture, and problem solving. They're very myopic, and they're responding to environmental stimuli, like the sound of a leak, the look of a leak, the feel of a leak in a dam, Thank God, because if they, if they did step back and did more deductive reasoning, I would never, ever succeed. This is, I mean, this is the kind of crap that I was building back in 1995, so I was no different than anybody else. I was just crazy enough to stay, stay with it a lot longer. You know, it's just junk. And then one day I put this wing on, like that's a wing. That's, that's the great trapezoidal concept I came up with. And that developed into this, and you know, for the for the time, that was a that was a pretty good flow device. But I've long since abandoned that concept. Um, I use a lot of pipe systems now because the beavers, again, not understanding the concept of hollowness, they're also very you know anything that's not part of their evolutionary history is is they just it's like traffic. You know, animals in traffic, they just don't quite get it, and and they probably never will. And and so um, the pipe is is powerful because it's, uh, it creates this what I call separation. This is where the leak is, you know, that or a culvert. That's an old mill house in Massachusetts. And uh, if you build a fence there, well, you haven't, bro you haven't broken that connection to the dam. This is the dam, and so they just start working in these two corners, and they'll eventually dam around the fence because there's no separation there. And the, what the pipe does is give you a separation um, between the, the dam and the leak. You're moving the leak away from the dam. That's the original uh, beaver deceiver, which, you know, that worked for a long time, but the beavers eventually dammed around it. And you saw from Patty's more recent picture that I, I had to add a pipe system to it to make it work. And this is, this is a, 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 one of my first, I call it a filter. That's the first filter I invented called the round, the round fence. Um, on a, a, be, a pipe in a beaver dam on the Penobscot land. Work, work in Virginia, this is sort of a, you know, it's, you can tell it's an old style because I went with a little trapezoidal shape. Everything's square now. The filter and the fence on the culvert, everything's square. It's simpler to build. It matches your materials better. There's a, what I call a square fence, but I kind of like the term wreck. Wreck, <laughs> as in rectangle. I think I'm going to change it. Plus, I, everywhere I go, everywhere I go, I see people like this, just like that, all the time. And they're looking at these little rectangles. And I think, so I think there's something magical about them. <laughs> so I think if I, if I emulate that shape, I think it's going to work. <laughs> so there's, a, there's an old brown fence in, in Virginia. Can you explain how, how uh, oh, it works? Oh, do I have to? Well, just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I'll try. It's your time. No, it's a. Yeah, this is a challenge because, uh, yeah, they're all they're all different. But anyway, I'm basically trying to sneak water away from beavers, and if you can do that, um, you can hold the water down. And if the water doesn't rise as they're trying to dam something, if, if the water doesn't come along with their dam, then that discourages damming behavior, right? Because they dam at the water line responding to spillover stimuli, the sound, feel, and look of leaks. And so I'm sneaking water away. There's a fence back here on a culvert. You have to, if it's a culvert, say you have to build a fence in front of the culvert so they can't directly clog the culvert. And I combine that with this, which I'm sneaking water through the pipe. They don't recognize that water's going through there if you can keep it quiet. 
And then, but you, if you just put a pipe out there, they would swim by the front of it and they'd feel that fast moving water going into the pipe and they'd bury it. And so it's important to have a nice, big, well-designed filter on the end of the pipe to filter beavers out and water in. Filter the water or sneak the water in, inside that, that wall of fencing and into your pipe. And so most of the time, you know, it's, of course the flows or rates are changing all the time, but most of the time you're able to hold the water down and then that dam can't grow around the, the fence on the culvert and you can control their behavior. And, but every site's different. Every culvert site in particular, you know, I, I just, I, I sort of, you have to deal with the topography that's there and the culverts that's there, a lot of different variables. And so to be successful, you really have to mold the, the system to fit that site. Beaver dams, what I call regular beaver dams, away from culverts are much, uh, it's, the, the flow device is much more constant in design because you don't really have to match the topography. Yeah, that's, that's when I was sort of making that transition, you still see the trapezoid and I use, I use a epoxy coated uh, mesh because the water is very acidic and it dissolves raw steel quickly and uh, I, I, ha I'm, I'm, I have to use what industry makes, right? They make six inch and they make four inch and neither one is ideal. There is no such thing as an ideal size, I don't think, because beavers come in all sizes. And so sometimes you get small beavers pulling debris through the six inch holes and this clog in a culvert. And uh, so you can see here, I've, I've staggered the fencing there mm -hmm. so they can't go through. And I put a second wall here so that if they do get in, they have to deal with two walls. I call those misery multipliers. <laughs> that's, that's an important concept, important concept. And then, you know, the, it's just such a harsh environment, you, especially in the north where you have the force of ice pushing on these things and then you have massive floods and you have the acid and you have beavers and so they they have if they're going to hold up they have to be built really well and uh, they are uh, I, I just think the best value you can get probably with anything you build is to build it to last as long as possible and so you don't have to be constantly repairing it or uh, maintaining it and I try to design these so you don't have, so there's no need to clean them constantly. Uh, occasionally, uh, that you have to do some, but I try to design that out. And I design repairs out, and I, um, you know, oops, did I go the wrong direction? Where am I? Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, just another, another design is based on the, uh, I don't know, that's the way I had to brace that. It's just, they're all different. But in many of these sites, you see, you see the result of uh, previous beaver dams having to be removed. And this is in New York State. There's a pipe system underneath the water there. So do you always use a pipe system now? Oh, always. Yep. Yep. That makes it so much more robust. And my pipe systems have gotten bigger and bigger. I mean, a number of the ones I did in, Virginia, uh, in the south recently were 18-inch diameter pipes. So that's a big pipe. That's about the most that I can move around by myself. And it's it's just great because um, for one thing it creates a it creates a salient call it a salient down the middle of the stream, which the beaver dams are generally perpendicular to the stream. Mm -hmm. So even if they they start working there, they're going to have a hard time connecting it. Mm -hmm. So it's just another barrier. It's another thing that makes it less natural and, and more difficult a damming environment. And then with with small pipes, sometimes this is not this is just an example of a flood. In, in the type of thing that you have, the forces you have to endure. But, but it's a good reminder of, of the whirlpools you can get when you get a good pressure gradient. Um, you get a whirlpool developing at the end of your pipe. And that make, hits the surface, it makes noise, and then the beavers will bury it. And so the, I, I, the bigger pipes, that's less likely to happen, right? You're not going to get those pressure gradients with the big pipes. Are they PVC? Why? Types of PVC. Uh, sometimes I use PVC, and uh, the, these black plastic ones are polyethylene. You know, uh, the trouble with PVC is nice if it's if you can get by with a small pipe, but you get up to 12 inch in diameter, and it gets real heavy. And I work a, alone a lot. Uh, just a, oh, there there you go, there you go. Or look at that. What's that? A little whirlpool <laughs> coming from that pipe. You see, the the beavers will key on that. And no matter how much separation distance you have, 
no matter how good your filter, they'll bury it. And so this is some, one, something I build, build in occasionally. It's called a whirlpool break. <laughs> I lost all my creativity after the beaver deceiver. <laughs> and just an example of a pipe system in a beaver dam uh, up in New Hampshire. Oh, another filter in Maine. And it's, he's, he's totally demoralized. This is, this, he's saying this is hopeless. And so there you can see a little bit more of the, the fence on the culvert. I hope this makes sense, but please keep keep asking questions. There's just so much to it, and I you know I I'm probably not explaining that good half the time. So the pipe when it's so here's the end of the pipe when the water level never goes below it'll go to the top of the pipe basically. Here's the here's the pipe and the water level stays up here near the top of the pipe, right? It depends. It depends on how much water is coming down that watershed. You know, sometimes. Sometimes it, I mean, the pipe, you never, pipe. You, I never put a pipe in that's big enough to hear, carry all the flood water. I mean, it would have to right. be enormous. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be times where it's being maxed out and the water's so coming when up. Somebody, so somebody wants to make sure their septic system doesn't flood, you guys have to determine exactly where to set the level of that pipe so that you can pretty much guarantee that their septic system won't take flood. I'm thinking about even Westminster West Village. Yeah, yeah. That was part of the issue. Yeah, yeah. You have to figure out, yeah, you, know, you set yeah. that pipe so that... Yeah, and that was a very undersized pipe. I mean, I was, and if you were thinking about the same site, yeah. I was really trying to protect that wetland, but yeah. I, I didn't want to drain it. But it's it's right. magnificent wetlands there. But, right. you know. but that's the whole anyway, point of this is well, to Well, yes, so. yes and no. I, I, I mean, the, the basic idea of a pipe system in a beaver dam is to control the vertical growth of the dam. So you're holding the water down so they're not putting new stuff on it because the water is being held down most of the damming season. You're going to have high, long sustained periods of high flow sometimes where it will come up. So it's going to be all over the place. But by holding the water down for you know a good part of the damming season, you're going to be controlling damming behavior, the amount of debris that's going on the dam, and the dam won't grow vertically. And it'll begin to shrink as decay processes take over as well. So, and, and sometimes, you know, if it's a very vulnerable area, I'll just put the pipe in low uh, in a beaver dam. I always do that at culverts. You can't, you just can't have a beaver dam, you know, in or near a culvert. and. Uh, but if, if, if there's a beaver dam, a regular beaver dam near a culvert that's threatening a road, let's say, and, and it's going to be a real problem because for one reason or another, like the road's really low, then I'll, I'll just put the pipe in. I'll say, I don't want beavers here. I'm going to try to just try to take this damming site away from them. I'll put it in low. But I'm still, ecologically, I'm still way ahead of the game because you don't have to kill all the beavers. And frequently, you know, those same live beavers will just move upstream or downstream and make a nice wetland that, that doesn't threaten anything. So you're still way ahead of the game. The, 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 the most important thing is to, is to protect whatever property is being threatened uh, so the beavers don't have to be killed. Skip? Yeah. I, I noticed that you've, you've got the uh, a exclosure right next to the, the culvert or, or dam. Um, have you ever considered uh, taking that entire culvert and extending it further further out it, it, it's the are you always uh, the other part of the question is uh, are you always using a uh, smaller pipe than yeah than the size of the and, and, and what goes into that uh, almost into always that almost always yeah, yeah. so you've yeah. always got a loose yeah. connection in between your pipe yeah and your and your culvert. yeah almost so, always and is, is that to take care of overflow events, uh, you know, to, as a safety valve, sort of, you know, if, if you get a flood, that it, it'll go into the big culvert under the road instead of yeah, being exactly. being forced through this small exactly. pipe. That, exactly. That, yeah. That, that's just yeah. your your little yeah. uh, yep. uh, your, your 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 siphon. Absolutely. Yeah. And mo I mean, most culverts are too big for me just to connect to and go out. Right. Plus, the longer I make that pipe, the less. Uh, hydro the hydro sure. blah, blah. More resistance to the water flow. 
or, or the less water you're going to, you know, right. the more friction, the longer right. the pipe, the less water. So I'm, I'm limiting the capacity of that. And I'm not, I don't want to do that for any client or any town. Right. And so, and, and besides, by, by, dam by controlling damming behavior, most of the time I'm not getting a big dam around this fence. <laughs> and so then when you get your big flood, not only are you going to get your flow coming through your pipe, but it's also going to be going through the fence right. too. Right. Right. And I always um, make, especially if the road is really low, I never want this to be the limiting factor during a flood. So I make the fence as low as I can right. to keep the beavers out. So when the big flood comes, it's going to flow over the top mm -hmm. and into the culvert. And it'll, this yeah. thing can never clog. Occasionally I'll have to put a, a roof piece on, but I hate to do that because if you get a big flood, you're going to have a lot of debris and, the, you know, and uh, it could clog if it's completely fenced over. So um, they don't fly? Well, they don't not fly. well, not well. That's just no. crazy. Yeah, <laughs> there's only a couple things that beavers don't do yeah. and do well, but that's that and flying are two of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this this is kind of fun. I don't know if I have a, a, a follow up slide, but this is up in northern Vermont, and this is a little bit different framing method and man made pond very deep, vertical culvert, which are bad because there, it's a it's a waterfall which is a powerful damming, noisy damming stimulant. Um, but this was very deep, and so I, I decided I'd design it. And there's a pipe system. Here's a PVC pipe going off to the side. I designed this. I decked it and built a, board, a diving board into it. So you can have fun with these things. There it is. There it is, yeah. Yeah. Because you have a real nice frame. It's not that you know, big a deal to add, add a roof. So Not much water is going to go through that roof, though, right? Who uses the diving board? Huh? Who uses the diving board? I don't know. I, well, hopefully my client does, or I wasted a lot of time. Oh. So it's really for a person. Yeah, the yeah. But, you know, because this is noisy, the beavers are going to dam around that like crazy, and that's why the, the pipe system is really the key, as it almost always is. So if you frame it out in wood, the wood doesn't deteriorate over time? Yes. <laughs> I use pressure treated, but still, it's not that. I don't think it's that potent anymore. They've taken a lot of the bad stuff out, like what arsenic. So, but um, that but that you have it's to so good to work with. You can't. I can build anything. I can. It's and everything's two by fours. The vertical posts. I put a point on those and drive them. The two by four is just a, a miracle product. That, that and duct tape. Huh? <laughs> that and duct tape. They are at the top. So how long will the wood last? Sometime you're going to have to replace it. I don't know. Hopefully 30 years, but it's hard to say. But yeah, it'd be, yeah. You may have to. I hate to admit it. <laughs> There's something to make plastic boards with from recycled yeah. bottles. Are, are those too expensive for you to use? No, I, they, I don't forever. think they're not stiff enough. They're not oh. rugged enough. Yeah. yeah. I have an 18 pound sledge and I pound, I pound on those vertical posts. I put a nice sharp point on them because there's so much force in trying to force this thing up, especially the ice. So I don't want them to move. And so I, I couldn't do that with anything plastic. So these are, it's just, we're so lucky. We have the, the, this thing called, this uh, tree called the Southern Yellow Pine. And, and there's so much of it out there in the south. And it's, most of our pressure treated wood is, is that. It's beautiful stuff. I tell you this. I, I was I was looking for it in in Mississippi at the same stores, Lowe's and Home Depot, and the quality down there is awful. It's all I think it all comes from plantations, right? And so they're growing those trees really fast, and there's lots of branches because they want to put meat on the tree, and so they're weak um, and they're knotty. And I, I, it's the hardest time finding. It. So most of their best trees, which are natural you know, trees that are have grown slowly in more shade and are, are not knotty and just beautiful. Most of those, they seem to be sending up to us, which uh, we have beautiful stuff up here. <laughs> so anyway, that's, a, that's in Maine and a double, the two 15 inch pipes and because it was a bigger watershed, so I just wanted to build it a little bit bigger. And the, you know, misery multiplier, inner fence is there. But I figured with, with two 15 inch pipes, I probably would uh, unlikely to get that big pressure gradient. And so I, I didn't build in a whirlpool break. 
uh, this is a, a little site in New Hampshire. This, you can see, see the topographical differences. It's really tight. There's no, no, no place to work in here, so I had to get real creative. And I do have a, a, little, a little separation there with a pipe underwater. Um, plus, the road is real low. But I, with experience and with wood, <laughs> with that wood you can just mold into any shape, uh, I believe you can do any site. And, uh, so this, this is a, a brand new feature. I just, I just sort of, you know how I said the pipe, the big, great big pipe will create a barrier and um, for the beavers, the, the, it's difficult for them to dam across. And so I just added that little thing out there just so it make it hard for them to move around. Just trying to complicate things for them, make it less efficient. That's a, a 18 inch pipe. And you can see how huge this is. That's in, that's in New Hampshire. That's, that's the same pipe from the downstream side. Ah, this, I like pictures like this. This is also in Andover, New Hampshire, which has been a great client. But this, this it's, it's fairly common, these magnificent wetlands nearby that threaten nobody. And you know, this allows you to protect those. That's very gratifying and keep, keep beavers in them, hopefully, hopefully. <coughs> Oh, that's kind of kind of a weird, kind of hard to figure out what's going on there. But here's the beaver deceiver and the culvert. That's the same site, and this is the road level. And I, I I looked at this branch, this pine branch that the beavers had nipped off, and it was like it was like four or five feet above the ground, but it was at the level of that, the top of the road. So it was just a little indication that that the water had been going over that road at one point, um, probably because the, there was a beaver dam in the culvert. So, another wreck, another wreck. This is a Notches Trace Parkway site. I, I showed you that, that thing earlier. Um, anyway, completely different uh, of any other design. They're all different. And uh, that's where the experience is really valuable. Have, do you have follow-up on that? Is that a recent? Uh, yeah, recent? yeah. I did that a couple years ago, and I just saw it a, a few days ago. It's perfect. And absolutely. And so the sound of the water coming out the other end of the pipe uh, isn't at, isn't causing them to the beavers to want to build a dam. No, and this uh, no, it's very quiet. And this is actually remember I, I mentioned the site where the, the most beautiful place on the Notches Trace, just upstream from this beautiful beaver flowage. And I was there in the spring working, and oh, the the the, the music, the the bird and frog music from that wetland. And they have a, if you, I don't know if you're ever down there, you guys will see it. It's called Ten Tom Waterway. And there's a pull off, a beautiful paved pull off road right beside the wetland. It has so much um, uh, potential for wildlife viewing and education and ecotourism, whatever, uh, simply because they, you have live beavers there creating that great wetland. But this is, and this is, this is a beautiful road. <laughs> Beautiful road paid for by U.S. taxpayers. Beautiful culverts, great big culverts, cement. Just it was a real pleasure to, to work with high quality culverts <laughs> and very steep, a lot of steep banks. And so what they would do, they would they would, and there was a number of sites like this. They would bring a backhoe down. They would chain the backhoe to a dump truck. And they would essentially dangle the backhoe over this <laughs> to try to clean that beaver dam out. Whew. So it was a little, a little bit of a safety issue, but also a, a you know a taxpayer issue, if you will, uh, an inefficiency thing. And uh, but you know if you can, if you don't have a you know somebody who can build one of these, then you're you're stuck with that, unfortunately, that that and killing. So it's a great way to. To save money and to make things a lot more efficient and to eliminate a, just a, a recurring headache, an endless headache that'll go on in perpetuity. Now, yeah, Kathy? Beavers don't ever need fuck for do they? Oh, pro <laughs> probably a little bit, but not enough to <laughs> make any difference. I was just difference. wondering, you know, because our beaver pond, which has been abandoned for a number of years, the buckthorn, because buckthorn tolerates that wet margin. So the whole edge of the beaver pond is just a thicket of buckthorn. Yeah, buckthorn loves that. I think that. that 
that is deterring them from returning because the other species that would have been growing in there are not able to come through because yeah. of the buckthorn. I mean, it seems like that's not my theory. What's your theory? Of my theory is predation rates. Human predation rates are <laughs> preventing that return. Oh, in, in my particular if beavers situation. are getting killed. Yeah, there aren't many dispersers. Dispersers, alive dispersers around, and we know that's happening there. Yeah. Well, I got the a good problem with our dam, though, too, is that we've had beaver come in there, but they haven't figured out the very old dam, and they haven't figured out that the leak is way down deep, and they start damming it, and it and the pond just doesn't hold yeah. up because the leak. Yeah, they'll get know. it. They'll get it eventually, Kathy. We have some more educated beavers. Yeah. <laughs> We got to get them back in there, though. We got to anyway. Uh, it reminded me of a buckthorn short story. I thought I'd share. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Thank you so Sorry much. Sorry, it went so long. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you really want to call me, you know, call me anytime. I know I'm just scratching the surface here, but so I just went for a walk into Putney um, Central School mm -hmm. Forest, where right. all the trails right. are. Yeah. And I went around back, and there's a great big, uh, not great big sign, a sign on a tree. It said no buckthorn exclamation mark. They were rightfully very proud, right? And then I looked at, looked into that area and there's like hundreds, hundreds of buckthorn stems. <laughs> so they might want to take that sign down. Because you can't defeat buckthorn, I, I'm afraid. So yeah, this is just another pipe system in a regular beaver dam. Just you know, sometimes the beavers will mess around on this end, and so I, I'll, I'll commonly put something some sort of piece of fencing over just to discourage them a little bit. This is actually a tidal area in Martinez, California, which is, uh, this has gotten so much attention. When I worked there, every news outlet from San Francisco was there. <laughs> Helicopters were flying over. And I'm just breaching a beaver dam. <laughs> it was so bizarre, so bizarre. Why are they plugging the other end of that pipe? Because it has a good filter on it. No. <laughs> An um, average filter on it, a uh, round fence, or so. If you run your pipe up, and it's very long. You see, I have good separation distance. It's a very long pipe, and the noise is way away from the leak. Yeah, Bob. So if you run that pipe upstream and down in, and the outlet is lower than the yeah. inlet, if that let's say the upper end of that is down in five six feet of water, yep. Will that will they try to plug that if it's unfiltered? Uh, not so much. Yeah, that's so a good good observation. Yeah. The uh, water around the filter acts as a silencing mechanism too. Okay. You know, because if, if if a pipe is just on the surface, you can you can get a little noise. It emanates to the air, oh, and it's unnatural. It's, it's a little that. unnatural for them to dam, build dams in deep water, yeah. which is about the only way a a culvert will not get dammed. I, I just had that thought today when I was on Sand Hill Road and looking at that bridge, and the water is very deep there. I said, oh, "That's great. That's great protection." Because most beaver dams are started in relatively shallow water. Mm. Anyway, this is cool because uh, the beavers were living right here, and uh, they were they would come downstream and, and forage in the tidal marsh. And then when when a high tide would come, it would go right over the beaver dam. So that, that was, wow. was kind of interesting. And they've been there. It's the most urbanized, polluted, gross area. <laughs> and yet the beavers have clung to an existence there for a long time now. Seems like 10 or 15 years. Oh, it's just a regular beaver dam site in Route 9, is it? Over there north of Keene. And this, this was a situation where the uh, New Hampshire Department of Transportation, this is a, 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 this is a big, beautiful wetland uh, owned by Audubon. But I was paid by the Lake Association, Granite Lake Association, just downstream. They paid me. Because what was happening is that the highway department would come in with a backhoe and just hammer that, hammer that dam every now and then, and there'd be this huge flush of, of fine sediments that would pour out into the outlet of that stream in the in the lake. Mm -hmm. So they were very concerned about that 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 pattern. So it's funny. I, I've been looking at that as I drove by there for decades. I've been looking at that dam and thinking it needed something. It's a 15 inch diameter pipe and a, a big filter that's a, about 10 feet by 10 feet with a whirlpool break on it. Uh, just an example of the forces of nature we have to deal with. This is over in uh, New Hampshire as, as well. Trees will 
laying on them, you name it. So this is a, a mink track. The nice thing about the six inch mesh is that, that most animals can go through it, like otters and mink and muskrat. But, ah, the great town of Wyndham, Vermont, where Bob's from. This is Burby Pond, and I said earlier we have very few big wetlands in this mountainous state, but Burby Pond is pretty exceptional, even though it's a, a man-made dam. But beautiful spot. That Burby Pond, for those who don't know, that used to be hayland right there. Yeah. Ah. yeah. Man put a dam down below where you're looking, yep. and then they, they've got a road goes out through there. Used to cross a little brook, but then they and they hate it, but then they decided to have a mill dam downstream for the industrial part. And that's what started, that's actually what created Burger yeah. Pond, original. So yeah. what are you doing there in the winter? There's a beaver lodge and a yeah. church steeple. Right. That's the highest town in Vermont yeah. in terms of elevation. <laughs> What's happening, uh, if, what are you doing there? Uh, you're on the ice, right? Thanks for coming. Oh, you're not leaving yet. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute, I gotta lock the door. You can't you people can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think who do you think you are? <laughs> she just flew in from West Coast. <laughs> Martinez? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So so the question is you're you're on the ice there, right? Yeah. Uh, what are you doing? I'm, I'm <laughs> are you repairing an old one? Or? No, I'm building a new filter. It was actually uh it was a very big system. It was I used a uh, eighteen inch diameter pipe, two two lengths of so forty feet very big system and I, I can float these things out into place yeah but I thought that just because it was so darn big I'd, I'd take advantage of the ice and I, I you, stuck, you, stuck it you, out you there. You built it in place and, and had verticals to keep it no 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 to, to, set, to allow it to go down. No if it's underwater and, 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 and this is the filter out away from the right, right. That's, the that's the filter and you're yeah. building it on the ice yeah so it doesn't. The ice melted it dropped it. Right yeah. I don't need to I don't need to plant plant posts on onto that it's just going to sit in the bottom. It's not going to be affected by any forces of nature. Uh, it really. wasn't going to float off a, in a nice No, no, no. Okay. No, it, although it does float for a while because, it, okay, because it's underwater, I don't have to use pressure-treated wood because it doesn't decay. Right. You know, it's not being exposed to much oxygen. Right. And so then I can use spruce, which is nice, and it's a lot lighter. But it will float for a while, but then it, it becomes saturated and sinks. Right. And there's quite a bit of steel in that. And there's prongs all the way around. There's prongs, so they'll stick into the mud, mud a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. And then the pipe goes. The pipe is attached to that, and then the pipe is pinned down at the other end by the culvert or bridge, whatever you want to call this thing. So it all it works out. But it's a the chairman of the Wyndham Select Board, Mr. Frank C. Wright, yep. and Cali. Cali. Huh? He's a neat guy. Great guy. Yeah, I've been a great He's supporter. A as has Bob, you know, the, the town of Wyndham has done a great job with this stuff. It took a long time, though. You, again, you talk about vetting, vetting, and the nerves involved. <coughs> I mean, I, I've been talking to them about that site for 20 years or, or more. And uh, it, it, it just took some good, a good select board to finally get it done. I'm sorry, Rachel. What? Do you have any suggestions for the way towns build culverts? Yeah, well, that's a great question. A great question because I that's out of my control most of the time, oh, and so when I get to a site, I just have to deal with that old culvert and with all its. That's my bad. Uh, well, no, no, you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> now I know what a viewer receiver is. We'll just, we'll just, I hope you enjoyed okay, it. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, it's great keep, to have you. Keep going, and those yeah. of you that have to leave, go ahead. See if you make it to No, don't encourage them. <laughs> See if you can make it to I'm just getting warmed up. The bar is open until 11. You guys got plenty of time. I already checked in on it. So, no, that's a great question. Um, and there are some things. One of the things I hate more than anything else is the, the damn riprap. It's just, oh, rip. It's like the thing to do. You just pile riprap at both ends of the culvert. And in order to protect that culvert from beavers, I have to be able to drive some posts, you know, that, that are going to stay there. <laughs> so, so, so that, if you, if you think it's a beaver site, you know, go easy on the riprap on the upstream end. And then sometimes the culverts will pitch downhill too much and there'll be a riffle, a big riffle inside. It makes a lot of noise that complicates things. Sometimes there's a hanging culvert 
and you have a waterfall and that noise goes through, plus it's hard for animals to use that stream, stream corridor. So there's a few things like that. But yeah, because I, I mean, it's, it's all part of the same system. That, that beaver deceiver or flow device is attached to the culvert. They're all working together. Same, same thing. And, and it's the same thing when I, use, uh, when I put one in a beaver dam. That beaver dam is part of the system. And if, that, if, I, if I go too heavy on that dam and the beavers abandon it, then the dam washes away eventually. And then you just have a flow device sitting there doing nothing. And the beavers may build a new dam up, you know, outflank it. So given that you might not live forever, are you training people to do this going forward into the future? Some, no, I'm going to live forever. <laughs> I decided. I thought about that for a while, then I decided to live forever. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, no, that's a huge. That is a huge dilemma that I face with. Just huge, because I I've given a lot of workshops. I've encouraged a lot of people. I you know my major competitor now. I I inspired inspired that business, and that that's just you know just cost me work now, and. Uh, as one example, but you know, most of the time people just go out and, and they build bad flow devices and they fail, and then people, it just sets us back in time. It sets us back in time. People get more resistant to flow devices. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the answer. I, I really don't know what the answer to that is. But so many people have have embraced that uh, that concept of oh, let's just tr you know train anybody to do it because there's not much to it. You can just take a workshop for a couple hours. And you're good to go. I mean, I, I was in construction for 10 years. I, I've been doing the beaver deceiver thing for 20 years. Uh, I, I had this commitment to wetlands and sort of knowledge of beavers that goes back 50 years, <laughs> 50 years of experience. And, and I'm, I'm really challenged. I, and it's brutally hard work, too. And so, how do, you know, I, I don't know how to get people to do it. The things I build are the big, you know, the absolute basic that will work, that will actually last a long time, work, and not require a lot of maintenance. I am not overbuilding things. This is all based on, on uh, trial and error. So, I don't know, but this is so simple. And having said all that about the need for experience, it's, it's, it's because it's, it's such unique knowledge. You have to, you know, just that appreciation of that, of, the, of what the, the, the value of the wetlands makes you determine never to fail, and never to to, to lose, you know, so that that alone is is a big part of what what, what will make you a, uh, successful. But it's a lot of things. But having said that, you know, people can develop those things, and you know, they build these little those little re rectangular things. Hum humans design those, right? <laughs> uh, maybe they're not as complicated as that, but you know, so it's not that complicated. We should be able to beaver-proof the state. With no problem, the, the the world, but you know, we have the ability easily, and, and I will, I will continue to try to train people. But it has not been a model that's worked yet, and so. The manual. Huh? You're going to write the manual. Yeah, but that's that's yeah, it's just enough to, enough to make people dangerous. It's still you know what I mean? Yeah, it takes somebody thinking. It takes somebody. Yeah, but I, I you know recognizing that I'm getting. Long in tooth, is that the expression? Yeah. <laughs> Very long in tooth. You know, I, I'm, I tell people, you know, just take advantage of me. I've, I've been foolish enough to, to focus on nothing else for 20 years. That's not going to happen again. You know, it's not going to be another person that comes along. Take advantage of me now, quickly. <laughs> you know? you got to make it look complicated and put in a little computer chip. <laughs> Even if it doesn't work. Yeah. And you say it's connected to my main, at my home. Yeah. You have to make it look complicated. Yeah. Bring a bunch of guys with you. Make it look like you're working, you know, a, you know because that's what people buy into. They I know, I this. know. <laughs> I'm the world's worst business person. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a terrible manager, bullshitter. So a I know. <laughs> I, I'm not good at that stuff. You're smart and the beavers at home when they're getting close. <laughs> this is just a, this is up in Maine, and I showed you a picture earlier of a wonderful wetland that you know this is going to help protect. But again, the 15-inch pipe is a barrier, kind of complicates the damming environment. But there's a little hole under it, so I just stuck that you know piece of fencing there, so they couldn't easily go underneath the pipe. So just little details like that are very important. Oh, there it is. There's the same site. 
Yeah. So the the beavers. Actually, this is another site where the town came in, and uh, they took it took the dam out with a backhoe, and there was a big flush of water, and the people were really mad, and and so, you know. The, the town, I, I understand that they have a real, a real s serious responsibility to protect the roads. So I, I, can, I can appreciate that. And they don't like people getting mad at them either, you know? So um, there's a way to end those conflicts, uh, I'm glad to say. How, but to build something like that, about how much does it cost? Do we have to talk about money? <laughs> Yeah, because it, it's 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 like the best investment ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it costs a little bit up front. Yeah. Pays for itself many, many times over. You need over a manager. Huh? You need a manager. Yeah, you can yes, right yes. I do. I think it depends on the size of the it project. It depends on the size of the project. But you know, I I am oh, Rachel, yeah. see ya. Yeah. yeah, thanks for coming. Okay. Bye Kathy. Thanks for coming. Yeah, was, nice to was see I long winded? Yeah. <laughs> You're passionate. Don't long -winded. <laughs> yeah, so there's a do, lot to it. I was thinking about, Pat, you know, Patty how much does it up cost? All time. Part, part yeah. of it, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little plug for you. Part of, you know, like there's a, there was a situation in Westminster West with a culvert, and I think the, the backhoe was out there, I forget how many times, and so oh. I was trying to convince the town manager that, yeah. to put in a beaver deceiver, and the beaver deceiver would have been a lot cheaper than... Yeah. And again, this year, I know I've noticed that they were right. They were having to, but anyways. Yeah. So, but the, tell, the tell beavers, them how much it costs. Just yeah, I, don't I know be I shy. will. I will if, it, if, if anybody you, stays. You should be giving out <laughs> business cards to everyone who's moving out of here. I don't even have a business card here. <laughs> I know how to reach them. I'm yeah. Beaverdeceivers.com. I do have some That's of your business cards. Wait. <laughs> what was it? So I, I tell people for a culvert, I've been saying this for 15 years, around 2,500 dollars. You know, they'll vary. The sites vary, but it's, it's pocket change. You know, because yeah. you know the thing about perpetuity, it's perpetual. <laughs> Do you guys realize that? <laughs> and so the beaver you kill is not the last beaver on earth. And so you're dealing with an endless. And, and, but I'm, I'm, you know, we're all guilty of this, and I'm one of the worst in, in every other aspect of life. Extremely short-sighted. But in this one thing, I, I just say, God, you got to you got to think long term, and we have to do that as a country with our finances. You know, maybe we, we have a, a relatively large debt, and it's because of this type of spending and, and behavior that gets us in, it's getting us into big trouble. So we do have to make some adjustments. No, nobody else can leave. <laughs> just another another filter. In Massachusetts, the whirlpool break. That's it. And uh, Colorado, you guys, you guys get the idea. It's the same everywhere in the world. New Hampshire, um, this is that same site in New Hampshire. I'm sneaking that water away from these guys up here. And I just built this fence just to keep them away from here. I don't want them coming down here messing around. So you can see how this, the, this even, even at Beaver Dam sites, this, the strategies and designs do vary some. And uh, yeah, that's a. So they do chew sometimes. I mean, the, the damming is the big issue. Within that category, culverts are the big issue. But then they do chew some trees, and people don't like that sometimes. So it's very easy. Now, this is something anybody can do. Now, it's not true that anybody can do a flow device. They're very sophisticated. But this is, it's helpful to have the right kind of wire and to have some basic uh, understanding of the techniques involved. But it's very very easy to protect trees in a long-term, non-lethal manner. Oh, wow. We're getting, getting towards the end. I mean, I already gave my speech about that, you know, our ability to build really complicated things means that we ought to be able to build really simple things like beaver deceivers. <laughs> and so this is, this is from the top of Mount Escutney, looking down towards Windsor. Some pretty impressive structures right there on the Connecticut River. Pretty impressive. And I don't know what that's all about, but I don't even know. It's a house and a road and beaver activity. This is what the dam's there. And I forget what the theme was. More work for Skip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, hopefully. And uh, this is this is you know um, my pond was real sterile, real sterile, right? 
and over the years, many, many years of beaver activity to bring that dam up enough, because it's a very long dam, very small watershed, it took a long time to grow that dam. Eventually, they got the water to go over this awful man-made um, environment there, which is sterile, never produced a brood of ducks. Yuck, like so many man-made ponds. Now it's teeming. The water goes over there, all these plants come in, and it's teeming with wildlife. It's produced an enormous amount of wildlife, all because the beavers had the time to, live beavers had the time to grow that dam. And not only that, but you know, a lot of people think that everything's in this cycle based on the food, tree food availability, but, but uh, a lot of times when beavers are able to have a long-term presence in a wetland, they can grow their own crops. Like these wet, they prefer to eat that wetland vegetation all summer and never touch a tree. And there's this wonderful floating leaf plant that you know, also have in Burby's Pond called um, Water Shield. And I think that's all the beavers eat all summer long. They just love that. Love that. Don't you find too, Skip, that one reason they do like to impound water is to make it much more easy for them to transport building and or yeah. um, the yeah. beavers back to where they want? Absolutely, Bob. That's one of the reasons yeah, for doing it, I believe. Mean. Yeah, it's, it, apparently, I, wanna, I can't relate to this, but it's far more efficient for them to, to do things in water than on land. Um, no better place to take your kids when they're growing up and they're little to yeah. see some stuff. I know, yeah. I know it. Otters, beavers, yep. ducks. Yeah, it's, it's, such, it's such a great value that, again, one of those things we don't quantify. We don't really quantify ecological values, hydrological values, aesthetic values, educational values, but we need to. We need to acknowledge them. Somebody mentioned earlier that they thought education was the answer, but the older I get, the more I realize that sometimes that's not always applicable because if you look at, I don't know how many of you followed that Deerfield Wind Project over there in Searsburg and Reedsboro, but they basically destroyed 70 acres of high elevation beach. Mm -hmm. They knew they were going to destroy it because they were so advised by a very well qualified bear biologist who had done a lot of research up there. Beyond those recommendations, they they ruled that they could build it, but they had to find replacement land somewhere else to replace what they're going to destroy. I'm not going to get into that, but they finally issued a permit for the, the first and only, so far, wind turbine project on national forests anywhere in North America. First time it's ever been done. So I'm not sure even education is going to work. It's a huge challenge. I, I, well, I, 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 yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is, Bob, but, but it's, 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 that's another example of you know, we think of the big habitat loss issues being somewhere else, but they're happening all around us all the time. And this gives us an opportunity to, to regain a little ground. So this is that, that same, this rich, rich wetland at my house. And, and also, also, this is a field that I haven't mowed in over 20 years. And so that creates wonderful, what's called early successional habitat, or, or shrubby, shrubby habitat just full of bird life and, and mute that springtime music. <clears throat> it's really, really uh, enjoyable. So you gotta think outside the, uh, the electronical wreck. <laughs> and think about the filter, filter wreck. And we can save a lot of money and we can create some real ecological and hydrological wealth uh, in, in all of our towns. So, um, thank you very much for your patience. I really appreciate it.